Concrete is the second most used material in the world after water. With the world's population estimated to grow to 9 billion by 2050 and 2 billion more people expected to live in cities, 60% of the built environment is not yet built. This represents the equivalent of building New York City every single month. In a circular economy, nothing gets lost. Everything gets reused and recycled in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach. By giving a second life to construction and demolition waste, we can preserve Earth's precious resources. I see a great potential in this area when you consider that 1.6 billion people lack access to adequate housing in the world today. The NEST is the largest scale demonstrator to accelerate innovation and research in construction. Together with our 120 partners from academia, business and the public, explore the future of buildings. Concrete is a great material. It's very flexible, it's very performing. It's my belief there is no way without concrete for our future. As the world's global leader in building solutions, we are shaping the future of construction right here and right now. The future is green, the future is circular, the future is digital. Sustainability is a game changer for all of us. That's why I'm putting it at the heart of our strategy. And we are experimenting the next generation of circular products right here, with 50% recycled content inside. This is a cargo ship. And this represents what we are doing in sustainability in La Fache Sim, because it's a journey and as you can see, we are moving. But more than a journey, this one is removing 100 trucks of the road every single day. And this is exactly what we want to do. We want to build a world that works for the people and the planet. In La Fache Sim, we are firmly committed to be part of the solution to solve today's climate crisis. This is why we set the most ambitious 2030 target in our industry, validated by Science Based Target Initiative. Carbon neutral building is within our reach. You can see it happen all around us here. By pioneering new technologies from digitalization to 3D printing, we are shaping the next frontier of green building solutions. But we didn't just look at what's a long term goal, we look at what are we going to do tomorrow morning. So, no time to wait. We must start running right now. By using advanced computational design and engineering, we can model the structure of buildings so that material is only used where it's really needed. It's about optimizing material performance through structural geometry. In the HILO unit, we really want to show the future of construction in concrete. More specifically, we want to show a new way of building sustainably and following the principles of circular economy. I'm excited to work in concrete because you can shape concrete where it wants to be. We developed a concrete with 100% of the aggregates and 50% of the cement made from recycled construction demolition waste without compromise on performance. And concrete is a prime material to offer sustainability targets because it can be reused over and over and over again. What you see behind me right there. This is construction and demolition waste. This is basically an old building. We broke it down in those pieces. We're going to grind it, make it back into powder, straight back in our cement or in our concrete. This is how this year we recycled more than 48 million tons of waste, making us a leading waste treatment company. Our ambition is to reach 100 million tons of waste recycled by 2030. Sustainability is to do a better world for the planet, but also for the people. So let's talk about the people for a second. In Malawi, there is a shortage of 70,000 schools as of today. We are building our first school in 3D printing right there. This is how we can support livelihood with our products. The beauty of concrete is that it doesn't only bring high strength and durability to construction, it is also infinitely recyclable. That's why for me, 
It is the ideal material to build a net zero future. I'm a big believer in the circular economy. The future isn't written, it's built. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Parametric Design and Digital Fabrication Outdoor Learning Spaces. Today is the first of a series of uh, online seminars and workshops brought to you by the UP College of Architecture. UP uh, Kaafi, the College of Architecture Alumni Foundation, and Holcim Philippines. Uh, parametric Design and Digital Fabrication are not really new concepts. But here in the Philippines setting, we are now just trying to uh, beginning to ramp up our knowledge and our uh, understanding of these concepts. And through this uh, seminar today and the workshops going on uh, in the future, we hope to expand our knowledge. And uh, our speakers are, are gracious enough to help us in expanding this knowledge that we really would like to uh, spread to a lot of students and professionals. So the program for today, we will begin with uh, welcome remarks from uh, all involved uh, organizations. And then our speaker will walk us through parametric design using Grasshopper. And after that, we will have an open forum and then go, go again to uh part two of our work of our workshop okay so for for today's seminar uh, i know that everyone will have a lot of questions so please uh be sure to write your questions in the chat but if we may request that during the open forum is when the best time for you to write your questions down in, in the chat would be um but for now please uh, make sure that you've registered uh, using the link provided before, so everyone can get the certificates uh, once we're through with the seminars and workshops. So at, today, as we begin, uh, first, let me introduce Dean Grace Ramos, the Dean of the College of Architecture, for her welcoming remarks. Hello, good morning. Welcome to this uh, very first day of a series of learning and knowledge sharing. And uh, this will run until the end of the year. And we hope to see you uh, until the very end of this uh, lecture and workshop series. This event, as uh, you know, comes to fruition with the joint efforts of the UP College of Architecture the College of Architecture Alumni Foundation, and Halsim Incorporated. It's very symbolic of the way to go as we stand up to challenges of the future uh, as a result of everything that we're experiencing now. Academics, professionals, our alumni, and industry have all partnered to become part of this transformative process and we, we know that uh, we will be seeing these processes unfolding in the coming days, months, and years. We are all preparing for new spaces of work and social engagement as we are seeing the effects of the confluence of the health crisis, technological developments, and even socioeconomic 
and uh, political issues. As designers, we are trained to deal with constraints, with the contexts and the opportunities that they present. We in the academe are hoping to be able to prepare our spaces for a new learning environment, which definitely will not be the same as before. And from today, we will be learning from our resource speaker and our faculty ways by which we can use design technology to reimagine spaces and to expand our rooms for maneuver as we think of new concepts for the times ahead. Tools for parametric design have been around for many years, but we're now facing more than ever the, the need for greater flexibility, rooms for iteration, and opportunities to break out from the conventional rigidity of built form. Let us then be very open as we, of course, are being critical as we learn new approaches and the processes uh, that are very innovative as we create new spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Ramos, for your welcome remarks. And now representing the UP College of Architecture Alumni Foundation is President and Architect Americo de la Paz. Good morning. Um, architect Amerigo de la Paz, and I'm currently the president of the UP College of Architecture Alumni Foundation. We are so happy to be part of this uh, project, and we uh, extend our congratulations to Dean Ramos and the UP College of Architecture for this project, and also to Holcim for sponsoring it. Uh, I'm a graduate of the College of UP in that was in 1977. And as you can see by that year, everything was old school. And But now, uh, since the advent of this new technology, I have learned to use some of this uh, CAD and modeling software. And I can see the big difference in, and appreciate the big difference in designing. And, and so I think the architecture students and architects of today are very fortunate to have this software available, this technology available. And I hope you will all make full use of this for us to be better architects, not only for our country, but for our, the world itself. And lastly, I would like to welcome all of you and uh, congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you, Architect de la Paz. And now, from some words from Holcim Philippines, our uh, private partner in this endeavor is Vice President Anne Claire Ramirez. Good day to everyone. Good morning to our partners from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, College of Architecture, College of Architecture Alumni Foundation, Dean Ramos, President de la Paz, Professor Santos, good morning, and of course, Director Lashones, Architect del Ocampo, and everyone attending this learning series. I am pleased to be attending this gathering on the parametric uh, design and digital fabrication that has been developed to focus on the outdoor learning spaces. I recall during my high school days, we had some classes, I think it was religion, wherein we were asked to go to the field of the school and our teacher would conduct some of the classes there. It wasn't really conducted like in a constructed outdoor classroom, but just making use of the benches that had already been built ever since our school opened. True, there were times we were got, you know, we were ex uh, distracted by being out, but for sure it was a welcome change of environment and being outside of our four corners, which we would be in from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. 
So there is really value being outdoors. Some say it is it, it provides a balanced environment that allows creative thinking, which is why most of the strategic and crucial meetings happen to be in places where you can see what's outside. The ongoing pandemic has provided society with the opportunity to change how we design our structures. It taught us to be creative and even to go back to the basics. This initiative for the outdoor learning spaces would certainly be a good kickstart to encourage normalcy for education with less risk as we know of getting the disease. I congratulate the men and women who thought of this program and I sincerely hope this gets to be shared to more people. Part of the whole Team Philippines commitment is to build greener, smarter, and for all. This learning series definitely um, hits every component of our company's thrust. By using designs that would build with less, resilient, and aesthetically remarkable while being responsive to the needs of its people, these are uh, sustainable constructions that we in Halton Philippines welcome very much. We believe that through these out-of-the-box ideas and pushing the envelope, we can create more designs and constructions that adapt to the changing times, like this new normal. And we hope that this session can further inspire soon-to-be architects to showcase their skills outside of the usual high-end development and share the same discipline and practices to help our communities who are in dire need to improve their educational facilities, affordable housing, and of course, public infrastructures. We are truly honored to be part of this endeavor as this supports one of our key proof points in our corporate manifesto, and that is thriving in people and communities. We would like to, together, rebuild progress for people and the planet. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much, KP Ramirez. Uh, and now, the uh, most important uh, part of our day, we're going, to, we're going to begin the online seminar given by our speaker. But first, let me take a couple of minutes to introduce him properly. So, architect Sergio Alonso del Campo earned his architecture degree from the University of Valladolid and Master of Structural Analysis via the Polytechnic University of Catalonia in Spain and the University of Padua, Italy. Having developed his professional career in different cities such as Valladolid, Barcelona, and New York, he now also guides future professionals as associate professor at the European University of Valencia and as a visiting professor at several universities in both Spain and Italy. In 2010, he co-founded ControlMed Advanced Design Center in Madrid, an authorized Rhino Fab Lab and educational center specialized in digital fabrication where he continues to cultivate his passion in parametric and computational design, design uh, digital fabrication, construction technology, research and innovation, and many more, and has graciously agreed to share his expertise with us through lectures and workshops, even if we're continents away. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome architect Sergio Del Campo. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can some tribute with my what I as working. Good morning, everybody. And stay sound and well. First, of all, um, I don't know if you are uh, okay. I think this is working. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, um, okay. Thanks for the knowledge of Ana Ramos, the uh, A Alumni Foundation, and of course all the staff of professors that they are helping me a lot with this uh, to make this uh, possible. Uh, well, the, the first, uh, the I mean, just to break the ice a little bit of this morning. Uh, you know, I was with the virtual world. It's it's quite difficult to to say that I'm already in Philippines and 
and I'm living this uh, wonderful experience for, for a few months. And, and well, this, this virtual world could be, okay, okay this guy maybe is in Spain. Uh, it would be very difficult because of the time difference. Right now, it's hours. Uh, so, so very, uh, you know, as I things and just that, maybe it'll be here in uh, You have mango. I think it's, it's impossible to find in Spain and it's in every day. It's a real proof that my day here. Okay, so that's just a joke, silly joke to break up, as I told. So let me um, show my. Give me one second. So, uh, uh, and with you, a few minutes, um, just introduce a little. Bit uh, um, my company, you know, the the, the, the business I, I created like ten years ago in a second. So it's, it's going to let me go to the next page. Let's see. Okay, it's working. So sorry, like ten years, ago, our partner so that he unfortunately can be so the time difference maybe. So I see the screens to you to everybody. Uh, um, so. On his behalf, I'm going to introduce a little bit of the, the business. So we are on a Rhino Trainer and official Rhino Fab, Fab Studio. Uh, Fab Lab, just in case you, you, don't, uh, you don't know what it is, digital fabrication laboratory. So we, uh, we come all together um, training, training part, uh, training or project or experiment. So I'm using lecture, right? So if you want to, to go deeper in, the, in some, some things, uh, just go there. Train activities, of course, related also to training, projects, and fabrication. So if you go just to training, we have more training in Spanish, of course, but uh, as you can see, there are different, different uh, workshops of different lengths, different hours, uh, especially the most important we develop is the certain parametric design that right now because of the COVID we are in a high we had a first Filipino student so he matched the difference he could make it and we started a new edition in November and this is a full program to be a, an expert in parametric design but see we have a, another workshop right now live online workshops um, you know uh, with a bay and Rhino and Grasshopper, basically. And um, well, these are different, um, let's say, institutions, universities. We we have taught uh, in Spain. Our big companies. We we have also developed some some uh, specific training. Uh, this website. Um, uh, I started. Yeah. You know the online training because of the COVID. So uh, you will, uh, we will give you access to uh, to the training uh, with an just an email, some instructions, so you can put a, a, a coupon code just to free training there. And there, find most free webinars if you are interested in certain topics or uh, other pre-recorded trainings. Okay, so uh, don't worry, but because you're going to sign in in this in this online dot control that come um, well some pictures of the workshops we developed for a bit uh, so we are always interested in bringing the digital world into something real something we can touch okay and and there's no this you see in the digital world there's no gravity you know everything works fine but when you put that into physical environments you know problems uh, happen sometimes right so um, more pictures about different workshops. Depends on the length of the workshops, we can build, uh, let's say, uh, smaller or larger uh, projects. Or also, uh, as I mentioned, um, about the, uh, you know, some collaboration with companies that they are interested in, in learning these tools. For example, we have worked with uh, helmet designers or chair uh, manufacturers, uh, 
even uh, the uh, you know instruments for music for music and so on that we can we can 3D model. Uh, I can, I will show you just the last the last project we we collaborated with a company. We we are not in charge of the design, but we were in charge of taking that uh, that uh, information that it was in BIM uh, software. So we took that and and manage that in Grasshopper to control the fabrication process, uh, uh, you know, uh, regulations concerning the uh, structural, uh, structural um, uh, designers and so on. So this is in Valencia and this shopping mall that is very close as you science and so on. So I think it's a really big project from this uh, just to to label, manage the uh, the different pieces, these kind of reefs or levers uh, to control some some parts of the design. Okay. Also for example in this case for a civil engineering co company that they need to, you to control the first uh, basement in the, this pre -coming. So uh, in this case, how to easily. Application, yes, going to, to very fast. Services, kits, designers, and, you know, they don't have the tools. They have the idea. So, so we can provide them a minute in uh, service 3D printing, in sculpture. Yes, you know, organic shape, please. Um, and that's uh, um, maps or prototypes. Uh, with artists, for example, the, the colorful picture is it's quite famous in Spain. So we, you know, the artists, they, they, they have the idea and we try to model to to bring them to make it at the end, right? or, or let's say architectural models uh, for competitions or to show the uh, um, yeah I can read that uh, you can listen to I don't know I'm I'm trying to do my uh, with these hard issues uh, let. To me, much much better. Uh, okay, for now. So, so here uh, be better for sure. Yeah, some other architecture of example. This is the by competition editions and. There are some scholars here. Um, well, projects. We we refer to projects that uh, projects with sign. You know, there is a client and, and it's interested using this 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 parametric sign. So we provide also the the sign part. So in the side you can check them in here. This um, uh, sample uh, furniture uh, pro design. And I think here are pictures, okay. All these collaborations in, um, or maybe this is a very old, a very old uh, design, but we are still love it. Uh, probably the first we, we apply the parametric tools for this, you know, this model that we put in a standard kitchen cabinet. So just to play some bottle of wines there, or this um, uh, Arab design that is based on the on the patterns, the Arab patterns in the, took that into Grasshopper to, and you will see with, in this uh, lecture today, um, we can apply these these designs into different stuff, different, like for example, the comp this competition we won in, in Doha years ago, or uh, for example, apply this pattern into, into, um, um, an IKEA, IKEA bookshelf. Um, more examples of the 
digital fabrication and parametric design projects, we developed these bookshelves that they look at this scripting, the change a little bit, the dimensions, the, the size of the panels, and so on. Or uh, another waffling project for a rooftop in Madrid. And again, we developed the scripting to, to, so, so everything could work. And we use that also for this other rooftop for a different client with different boundary conditions. But at the end, you know, uh, we, 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 we used that basis design. Uh, or these uh, benches for IKEA group in a shopping mall in Spain. So we, des we designed uh, these two uh, twin uh, benches here. So there are some pictures over there and some, you know, some drawings of the final and, and yet. And the last project, I'm going to, to show you this this one probably the, the 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 one that we are more you know satisfied because we we have a lot of freedom which is not very usual as you know in architecture because of the client the money and so on so here we have a lot of freedom and and we decided to to use all these tools to you know to apply to the Japanese Japanese uh, uh, restaurant so I, I'm going to show you a little video here. So uh, as we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to go fast. Okay. So we were using like the salmon texture like, as a concept to uh, try to apply in, in, in plywood uh, uh, panels. Okay. So here you see you have a, a summary of the, the uh, of drawings and 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 how we we, we make that into digital fabrication to the machine just press the play button and everything is set up and fortunately there is a lot of you know polishing sanding and so on a lot of past production in these in these processes okay so here you have some you know some frames and of course you have this information in, in our website okay okay great so let's go to the um, um, you know, I'm I'm very worried about the about my my micro today, but I hope you can you can follow me at least. So let let's start with the first um, presentation today. Uh, we divided. We have a coffee break because there are many concepts. So I think it's better just to relax and at least for the second presentation. So in this first one, I'm just going to talk a little bit about parametric design and just to an introduction to those specific especially uh, to those that they don't they don't have an idea don't worry uh, you can I hope you can understand much better uh, in just 30 minutes of presentation okay so these uh, the Simpsons right they're very popular in Spain of course and I don't know if you remember this famous uh, part that uh, Frank Gehry was throwing this this paper and you know suddenly it changed into the new museum from for Springfield right and and the people is totally amazed by the new design this is cool I'm not telling this is wrong of course uh, it is based on talent or a lot of hard work experience and, and many situations that finally you can design these uh, let's say crazy ideas that's that's uh, wonderful but uh the the thing I'm going to explain right now it's that it's possible also to design let's say not based on the you know of, of conceptual uh, ideas but also with data okay so that's what we call parametric design or design with data and then well just keep in mind this picture this is a BMW car uh, design along the you know the history, the years of the of the brand. So just keeping keep that that picture for for the next examples. I'm going to explain some keywords I use a lot in this model for, for making parameter input output. Don't worry, we will you know start explaining a little bit all these keywords. Uh, well, starting from the beginning, the sketch path probably the first let's say parametric. Software developed by Ivan Sutherland in MIT in the uh, 60s. Uh, this video is in, in YouTube, so if you want to take a time uh, during the weekend. But just to, to give 
you, you know, this large screen they, they had, but at the end it's working, you know, with this optical pencil. So uh, only with line and us. And by, by the position of the, of the points, it was re reacting, reacting to the new uh, condition, to the new position of the, of the line of the arc you want to design. And this is pretty amazing that you can also interface here. You know, the first that is the top view, the front side, which is something very common in Rhino and many, many 3D softwares, right? So let's say the, the, the first attempt uh, uh, concerning computer ready design and parametric uh, design. Okay. Another sample in architecture. So, uh, this steady model by Luigi Moretti. Um, you see, the design is, is not the main goal, the main uh, focus on that. It was based on topographic curves. So the, the, the let's say the strategy was trying to, so every every uh, guy was going there to watch uh, or to, to see the football match has the best, the best view of the field. Okay, that was the main condition. And, and well, you know, following kind of, you know, hand drawing, and 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 these uh, uh, curves, it was giving the final, but it's not, you know, a previous condition. Okay, it was something based on, on the uh, parameter. The parameter is the best, best view as possible. Well, to um, to let's say uh, for, for for example, the second one is quite famous, sense by Mies van der Rohe. You know, architecture stars when you carefully put two bricks And the other is quite controversial. Architects don't make buildings. They make drawings of buildings. Uh, well, uh, I don't know if you recognize, uh, the, especially the, the left, uh, both drawings, the left, uh, the left picture is, uh, by, is uh, the monastery La Tourette in the south of France. And the other on the right is a convention center, but it's only just was a competition. So the main difference, I mean, both both drawings are the same. One is the the, the only difference built the Latourette monastery, and the other there is not. It's just a competition, and finally couldn't be uh, built. I think if I'm not wrong, in the USA. Okay. So let's take to the little change of the of the of the world here of these sentences. So the first one by Artrud Tedeschi, one of the pioneers in this computational design with, with Russ Hopper. So architects don't make buildings, they make diagrams of buildings, which is a crazy guy by, by, by the art of putting two bits together, right? Not two bricks. Okay, so just to, you know, think about it, maybe during the the weekend. Um, I always say my 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 tell my students that, uh, and and I don't know if it's, it's still working. I'm not sure if in five, ten, fifteen years from now, but it's directly to the mouse, and it's to use you know, a piece of paper, a pencil, even to you know to think about the, the parametric design, scripting, things, and so on. But still, I mean there. There is like a problem, especially with reading the scale, because students they usually when you when they are in the three D, uh, they think that everything is you know large, and they have a lot of space and so on. And at the end, they are finally they they are dealing with something concerning millimeters. So you know, still I I think that's my 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 opinion of course my my feeling that still you you have to Sir, and you have to, and it's to think into into the computer, okay? But it's going to change, and I don't know this future is so fast. So let's say, well, another another samples here. Um, again, the the picture on the left is very famous, maybe difficult to recognize at this time, but it's by Michelangelo. It's the Florence or in Firenze in Italy, uh, the National Library or the public library there. It's very close to the David Michelangelo. So it's, if you are, I hope you can you can travel 
people soon to Italy and New York to the, uh, David, the sculpture. And it's usually it's a very long queue, a very long line. So just go to, the, to this other building because probably they have the most beautiful stir I, I, I've ever seen. And it, the other one is just, you know, standard American stir, like these kind of famous uh, blue copies. And well, what I can show you here, there's a, let's say not a lot of, you know, change in centuries. Uh, according to, to the, how to show or how to display the architectural information in this case, right? Of course, there's a change of uh, the, the, the technique or the tools they're using, but, but I think that not, let's say, uh, a very, very, very huge difference. And, and let's say neither with the with the traditional computer design, traditional AutoCAD, at the end, and, and so really sort of trying to draw uh, something similar what you are doing with the pencil or with the ink, right? But the thing is that you, you can uh, speed up the process with, uh, you know, with the help of layers, blocks, uh, you know, different draftings and dimension tools. So to, you know, to, which is sometimes is quite boring, but, but it's still, I mean, still, although you're using a computer, I think there's not a big change on that. My suggestion here, my understanding, the a huge step, it's when the first commercial parametric software started uh, appearing in the you know in the nineties, in the twenty years ago, and so on. Uh, quite famous ones are uh, Katia or SolidWorks. So the idea here, where Katia is a wonderful, a wonderful software, very difficult to learn, very very extremely expensive but you can do a lot of things. And the, the idea of these softwares is that you, for example, you want to change a little bit the diameter uh, of these holes or the dimension of the piece automatically reacts to the entire geometry. Okay, so that's the good thing. You don't need to control C, you don't need to go back to certain point and change again all the, you know, all the piece and so on. So this like reacting all the time. That's the basis of the parametric design things. In architecture, um, we can find um, similar samples, Archicad, all plan softwares. At the end, you need to make a stir. So there is a library of stirs. You choose the, you know, the shape of the stir a little bit, the number of steps, the height of the handrails, and so on. So you know, everything is kind of parametric. It reacts to the new conditions. Okay, something similar to the BIM systems. Okay, I'm not going to, into that because it's a huge topic, but the BIM systems at the end is something that is changing already the, the, the way to, to phase the architectural drawing because at the end, what you are doing that says is building the 3D virtually. So you can find a lot of troubles that before that was something that the, the only way to find them, it was in the real construction and it was a, a really problem, a big uh, regarding money and, and, and time of the uh, construction pace. But in this case, you are you, you see the three D uh, you are getting with the building information uh, modeling is just let's say smart information you can get from these virtual three D uh, drawings, building analysis schedules, as you can see, uh, drafting and so on and so on. Right, so it's very very interesting. And, and quite important nowadays. But let's say if I want to design, well, I have two situations here, right? I need a, a unique stir, something special for uh, you know the hotel entrance or any uh, specific situation, right? Something is not on the market. Or on the other hand, I need some you know different uh, different attempts, different. I want to try different designs because it's not clear the you know the solution. So I need something fast to generate and see many options of the stirs. Right? It's not necessary to go in a very complex. I don't, I don't mean that with complexity, with advanced design and so on. It could be something very very simple. Okay. So some years ago, the only way to do that it was call a guy that he or she was an expert in language programming. So 
it was possible to go into AutoCAD or 3D Max or another software, and with Python, which she has as Visual Basic, this language programming, it was possible to make your stir. Okay, but bad news, you have to learn this language, and learn this language is tough. Okay, Grasshopper is tough, but this is even tougher. <laughs> okay, that's the that's the thing. So the solution to that for many many users in the digital well, it was trying to use a visual programming. So instead of coding, typing, and so on, which is if you miss a space, if you miss a letter or something like that, everything is not working. You say, oh my God, what's going on? So the visual programming, I think, is more uh, user-friendly. And it's not only in architecture, not only in parametric design uh, for designers or for architects, but as you can see, there are many uh, visual program programming apps for you know for music for musicians that you, they can play the different instruments and the length of the and the level of sound and so on so they can try to you know to 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 play uh, their own music with these apps and also for ux design or app design like instagram or facebook and so on they're using the developers are using this visual programming because it's you know, it's much easier to to understand the workflow of the of the scripting, right? And here you go. You have uh, Grasshopper the top and Dynamo, which is for Revit for Beam. And you can see it's just copy and paste. <laughs> you know, Autodesk. They 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 thought that it was very nice, and a lot of users they were using Grasshopper in Rhino. So they decided to to make something very very similar, Dynamo and apply into, into Revit, OK? So you see the workflow is very, very similar. So to sum up here, uh, we love Rhino, right? We love Grasshopper. And yeah, we love Grace Hopper. That's the you know kind of playing with the words. Uh, that's the reason that Grasshopper is called like that because Grace Hopper uh, was the pioneer of computational design. Very interesting uh, story. If you just go to Wikipedia and so on, she was in the army and and uh, created uh, uh, her own language program. Final round it was called Colbo, something like that. And you know, very very interesting to read a, li a little bit about the. Um, about that, her birthday is in December now, your information. OK, um, so I'm sorry I'm going fast, but uh, you know I, I'm very tight in the schedule to show you a lot of things. So that's, that's why maybe I'm speaking very, very fast. So let's define algorithm. Of course, the first thing to go is there to the dictionary, say what it's telling you. So if you read that, it's, it's telling you that it's a set of, of uh, mathematical instructions followed in a fixed order, um, and especially given to a computer. So it will help you to calculate and answer a mathematical problem. So it's, you see, as you think it's mathematics, uh, computers, and so on, and it's great, it's fine. Of course, it's the dictionary. <laughs> I have to believe in that. But the question is, only mathematical? Because you're probably you are solving more algorithms than you think. For example, this quite silly algorithm that you can find in any instruction manual. So let's say I have a problem with my lamp and it doesn't work. So you just go to the instruction manual, manual and say, OK, I have my lamp is black, or my bulb is burned out, or no. And then it's giving you, based on yes and no, it's giving you uh, different outputs, different solutions, right? That's only a joke for engineers. <laughs> Sorry, engineers. But uh, I mean, if you are facing a trouble that your machine uh, should move and it's not moving, that maybe you need to apply you know, this lubricant, uh, WD-40, I think is uh, internationally known, right? And, and and if it's it doesn't move, but but uh, I think it's, it's you're facing a trouble with the movement. Maybe you need some tape on it. Okay, but that's forget about that. Is also a silly a silly algorithm, a silly example here. So um, another situation, and maybe I need to update it because with my bike, it's, I don't know with these new li liquids that they put in the in the wheels of the bike, it's very difficult to get a puncture. If, actually, I don't remember. Maybe two years ago, I got a puncture. Uh, right now, so maybe I change in the next presentation. But right now, just to understand, so if, let's say that you need to fix a bike puncture. Of course, you need a bike. You need energy. Maybe I mean to get a puncture if the bike is stopped is 
weird, and also bad luck, right? And here you have some ingredients, some necessary tools to fix your bike, right? And what is really important, you have to follow these steps in a very logical order. If you're making crazy things like going to the step number seven, wait and put pressure, and then go to the step number two, and so on and so on. It's, let's say the, the solution maybe is not great. So how do we translate that into parametric design? Well, I have my input parameters, you know, the wheel, the bump, and so on. The steps that have to, they have to be follow, followed in a very logical order. And the output that, of course, what I want is my bike should be uh, fixed, right? So this is the most important thing to understand. And geometry are totally connected. So I'm going to show you some, let's say, geometrical algorithms that we can solve using using REST Hopper. So um, again, coming back to the first picture, right, in this presentation, the, the, the BMW cars. So you have, a, in all the cars, you have some conditions some boundary the city the light positions maybe the you know the the brand design the style of the bmw car so you want to follow so something is similar with the geometrical parametric algorithms so at the end you have different solutions different outputs but if you pay attention a little bit they though they seem very very different they have certain, uh, let's say, common patterns, common um, um, designs at the end to, to generate and given uh, uh, a much more, more different output solution, okay? There, there is something in common. Similar to the carbs, right? So pros, good things news the process is more important than the result people seeing res hope or you have many many, many results. and these results can be obtained in sec and sec are coming after sec well that the uh, uh, industrialists try to make one thousand all the equal same, right? Because in time, saving on the, you know, getting more fusion in the industry and so on. The digital location tool, the idea, and generate series of unique objects, so family of objects, and I can produce a robot example, can make 1,000 table, and each table is customized a little bit. You can create slightly different so 1,000 space objects. Okay, so the, and and to show you, you know, these ideas. So, for example, in jewelry design, so you can, you know, generate different designs with a space, but all of them are quite unique. Let's say, or you know, BMW they have a research department. Actually, there are many car industry brands that are using Brian and Grasshopper because they find it very useful for the pattern supply to the to the surfaces of the so in this case bmw was using uh um grasshopper connected with with this you know uh, lighting system uh to provide different information to but okay everything is <laughs> fortunately everything is not always good this is still a slow and tough process you will suffer it okay <laughs> don't worry i will try to explain as much as I, I can, but uh, still it takes time to uh, practice, to learn the new tools. Sometimes it does not work, and you go to bed asking you why, why it's not working, and then you ask next day to your colleagues, okay, why it's not working, and maybe in, in one week you discover that you were doing something wrong, or maybe it's the, the software is still not you know, giving a, a proper solution. So, you know, it takes time to get used to it. For large information, large data still consumes computer resources. And well, this is totally personal and, and subjective. I mean, it's a free tool. And when you go to with a free tool, 
you go to free complexity. And maybe you, you, you need to stop a little bit and say, what I'm doing is fine. It's a little kitsch. It's beautiful now. So if, of course, it's up to you. And, and, and I'm just bringing here this, this wonderful uh, Rata Isusaki. I think it's in Qatar Convention Center. And, and they decided, I mean, it's, the concept is quite interesting because instead of, of having the typical courting wall, putting a lot of steel columns on this facade, they were trying to save a structure, a structure and also for money and so on. So they were trying to optimize the structural workflow, flow, try to, to support the, the roof. Um, with this kind of, you know, topology, uh, efficient approximation to get the forces uh, flowing from, from the top, right? But at the end, for they, I think they were trying to to, to make something similar to a and so on. Maybe the translation is the it's, 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 in my opinion, just take example. Uh, so let's read the uh, grasshopper. Uh, like Rhinos, so due to the language program, uh, Jim was very funky because um, at the end, it's giving you very complexity, very complex. Um, uh, and crazy designs, but it's not necessary. You can do very, very simple. To be they're going to be used. So that's the website to to learn Grasshopper. I'm going to show you uh, some some interesting um, uh, webs. And at the end, the important thing here you can in multiple Excel for Beam, Fem analysis, and so on. And not only data. Uh, uh, let's say for for connected softwares, but also hardware. So it's it's quite also there are plugins to connect with Ar Arduino. So, I mean, uh, this is the, the main picture of Rhino. So the Rhino software, and the idea here is that Rhino is very easily to connect with uh, multiple uh, scripts plugin. So if you know how to use language programming, you can develop your own app, your own plugin for Rhino. And let's say Rhino is quite open to connect that compared to another word that they, they have a more, let's say, a closer environment. So here you go, you have Food for Rhino. This is the main website that you can find uh, almost 1,000 apps or plugins, a lot of them for free. And as you can see, 40% of the plugins are aimed to architecture, and also there are many for Beam and civil engineers. So just go to the website, and you can try to find plugins very, very useful for your uh, 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 daily work. Uh, um, also for Beam, I mean, some people they you know they think that Beam and Revit is the same, but there are many platforms, and if you don't go you don't want to go into into Beam software uh, with Revit. You can just make Rhino a kind of more Beam friendly with about architecture. Uh, and and this is new in the last version in Rhino. You have Rhino inside Revit. Okay, so that means that well, three you can connect three softwares, right? You connect Rhino, Revit using the connection is because there are many users that they're working with Revit and they were complaining, you, you know, trying to use the best of Rhino and the best of Revit and, 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 and do it at the same time. So, of course, you can find in McNeil Wiki some, some information about Rhino inside Revit. I'm just going fast here and, and a little video about how it works. I mean, it's, you need some knowledge in Grasper, Rhino, Revit, net, but at the end, what I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that you can uh, see lively the you know the connection and using you know Grasshopper and Rhino and Revit at the same time to to play with it. Okay. Just to give you, there is a new release already, uh, a new version for the Rhino and Revit. And well, samples with Grasshopper. 
for example, you see I can generate very easily 10,000 points with coordinates X, Y, and Z, and connect that with uh, picture information, the pixels information. So I can translate these pixel values with the coordinates and you know use circles, which is something I can I can take to a laser machine. Or I can move a little bit these coordinates, this x, y position, and try to connect with a, with a picture and use that for, for uh, generate louvers or camps that they look like to the Marilyn Monroe picture. Okay, so that's an example of that. A famous Voronoi grasshopper that it's, it comes, it's very interesting uh, mathematical approach, but it's already in nature that you can find the Voronoi salts, but it's also applied to in architecture. So it's something easy to, to do in, in grasshopper. Or, and again, I'm, talk, I'm, I'm telling you that is everything here is data. So you can uh, you know, use that data to connect with climatic analysis with the location of your building and try to understand which is the, uh, you know, the, the worst area to, to get open windows or, or the, the, the most uh, important wind direction and so on to an at the end, analyze information. Okay, I'm going to skip this just to because I, I know that I'm I'm very I need to stop soon. So um, just to mention, and we're not going to form finding because it's a more complicated stuff. But let's say that architects, designers, we are always in form making, right? This thing with form making. Let's, let's say the one hundred percent of form making should be sure. Let's say they, they want to generate um, uh, a bicycle with a square wheels. Could be because it's art, right? It's not necessary to be functional, to be useful. The other, the other side, you have pure form finding, engineering. So engineers, they don't care about how the beautiful uh, could be the design of the bike and so on. They want the lightest bike, the fastest bike, the, you know, the more uh, efficient and ergonomic, right? I mean, there are some people like Saki that they, they talk about sensitive analysis. So they stop a little before. So you have again a bike very, very useful, very, uh, uh, let's say, efficient, but uh, you stop a little bit uh, thinking about also the. So just to give you an idea, a rough idea, how form finding works. So I mentioned before that the typical uh, workflow in Grasshopper is that you have the inputs, steps, and output, right? So what form finding is doing that in thousands of iterations, repeating a lot of time, and giving you the best result. The best result for the computer, not for you. Maybe you think to later on if that best result is the best result for you finally, right? So this is how for finding making uh, works. And maybe, um, well, probably some uh, form finders <laughs> in history. Do you have Antonio Gaudí or the constructors of the fan vaults in um, in England, in UK, or Felix Candela? It was uh, you know they were thinking a lot about the the, the try to look for the optimal uh, shape, okay, the optimal function here. Even Sagrada Familia and Sagrada Familia, they are playing with Grasshopper in Barcelona because they, at the end, if you think about what I'm telling you, they, they can provide, they can generate a family of objects and, and decide because, you know, in Sagrada Familia, there are many, you have the chief of the construction process, restoration uh, responsibles, and um, what else? I mean, you know, landscape designers, so many people there. So at the end, they can produce that. They can 3D print the design and decide what's going on, or maybe what Gaudi sh should be should that should should do. Sorry, in the in the next step, right? So that's the reason that um, they are playing with with this hopper. Um, I don't know if you are studying these graphic studies, probably. In my case, I was a lesion of architects that uh, we were struggling in the in the College of Architecture with these study graphics. It's interesting to to learn how to shape to get shapes based on forces and so on. And the thing is that okay, this is possible, this is feasible in two D. But what's going on when you're going in three D? Okay, so I have ten minutes. Okay, so it's 
good enough. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. I'm almost done. You, you see these kind of structures, membranes or pure compression uh, structures. So fortunately, you have some plugins, for example, Kangaroo, that is a, a already uh, integrated in the last versions of Rushhopper that, that you can play, you see, a Voronoi, a Voronoi pattern with some, you know, the, the guy here start like putting some holes and new conditions and new restrictions and the shape is like you know you you you, know, you don't care about how final shapes make some iterations some tries here until you finally you maybe you are okay so that's that's one example of form finding uh, shapes and also he's using here uh, galapagos which is a uh, a more complicated algorithm in Grasshopper to look for the optimum shape. Um, I, I will show you also in the next presentation a lot of uh, examples by Philip Block, PH Zurich. They have very awesome uh, works using form finding and, and, and they collaborate with, uh, with Halsim. Too. So in this case, they're using uh, their own plugin. That is a plugin. You 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 can try to look for it in Rhino Vault. Rhino Vault. So they're using form finding directly in Rhino. It's a very uh, interesting plugin. A little bit of of let's say of practice and uh, structural background. So. You know they're playing with both ceramic pieces, very used in the in Spain, in the and Mediterranean areas, and uh, the last century for affordable housing and so on. So at the end, it's working only just the sh using the form, the shape, and also with this uh, pavilion or, or this structure, let's say uh, in the um, in the last Biennale of, uh, of Venice, I think 2018, 2019. So they were using these stones that they are not glued together, they're just working by by the shape, okay? So so hopefully they, they could do that. So again, just to finish this presentation, how for mining works, again, some uh, restrictions, boundary conditions, you know, structural properties of the material and so on, and at the other is giving you, is optimizing, uh, uh, through several solutions until it gets the, let's say, the most appropriate shape for your boundary situations, okay? So something similar they have done with this form finding shape by this concrete, Stratus 3D, uh, again by uh, Block Research Group, Research Group, Saha Hadid, and uh, Incremental 3D and Halsim that they were developed in the, yeah, the Venice, the Viennale of Venice of this year, yeah? so. It's pretty new uh, sample, so there is a little video to understand a little bit the, the process of the form fine shape. Okay, so it's based on, you know, something static graphics, but in 3D. Okay. So, question Should architects, designers, engineers learn to visual code? And the answer is, this is still a question. Thanks. And stop shading the screen. And I'm ready uh, for, you know, for, uh, I hope you, you find some questions. Thank you very much, Architect Serio, for walking us through parametric design uh, with Grasshopper. Uh, it was obvious that you could have taken two, three hours to walk us through there. So thank you for cutting it down into the 45, 50 minutes that, uh, that we have. For the audience, uh, today is a perfect time for you to uh, write down uh, in the chat box your, your questions that uh, you may want uh, Architect Sergio to tackle. Uh, but first, if I may, Architect Sergio, uh, I've just heard anecdotally that some people, some designers would think that uh, using software this much would stifle their creativity. Uh, but from your introduction, it seems to me that uh, it really, it gives you some more possibilities for where you can be creative. Uh, 
would you have something to say uh, and to not be afraid of uh, these types of opportunities? Yeah, of course. I mean, don't don't, don't be scared about uh, you know <laughs> a lot of information. I just show you um, you know all that impossibly this but we have to st uh, start step by step by step and i and i told you that when you the first time you you type grasshopper of parametric design in google you have a lot of you know uh, uh, crazy uh, some crazy designs okay I, I cannot deal with that it's impossible but of course uh, we we're going to you will see basic design some Something that you can manage and understand very well. Of course, there is a point, there's a key point, point to understand the most difficult part of parametric design is to understand the behavior of the least management, the management of data. Yeah. In, 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 uh, with this data, under design, I'll say, well, I was expecting, you know, 10 times less information. So the only uh, problem here is time. We don't have a lot of time to to play with Grasshopper, but at least to give you a rough idea. And of course, don't worry that this, uh, we're going to start from very, very scratch or very basic information. All right. Thank you, Architect Sergio. I had another question, but you know what? This is not about me. This is about the audience. So let me, uh, let me read to popping up. A uh, question for Corazon Gonzalez. What building types would you suggest that parametric architecture will be applicable? Um, a lot of architects um, use this, this design uh, and also pro designers for facade because it's also quite interesting to you control the the patterns or if you are designing or an interior design panels it's very easy to apply a texture and practice with different textures different tries and different drawings so there are many people that we already have with uh, architectural companies they, they want into that is how to you know how to manage this information the facade design the patterns and how to bring that information into special uh, fabrication projects okay so that's the important thing and, and yeah in this case uh, of course revit is much powerful because it's already let's say more ready for a standard uh geometries standard architecture but at the same time if you want something new uh, or you have a w curve surfaces, a double curve facade, and so on. In this case, Hopper Rhino is going to help you more to to, to generate these these uh, uh, this panel designs. Yeah. Of course, I'm used to see many uh, situations. I mean, only facade to end the screen from from zero so can apply to furniture pro design uh, yes thank you uh, architect sorry you, you cut out a little bit but uh, I think you were saying that uh, the easiest way obviously and the most obvious would be in facades and whatnot but really the applications should be uh, even a little bit wider than that, from large scale to small scale, uh, many different elements of these structures. So, so now we have a question from uh, Pura Valle. What's the easiest way to manage data for parametric design? Well, I, I hope you can listen to me uh, much better. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Um, this is a difficult question. This is way to manage the it's so open question that um, I don't know, difficult to answer. This is way to manage data. Uh, well, at the end, probably, of course, <laughs> maybe the, 
the solution you can find it in the next model on the on model third. Uh, but if I uh, if I have to start with this parametric design, maybe the uh, the first way is try to learn. First of all, a little bit of Rhino. So it's not necessary to have a lot of uh, Rhino experience, but at least to understand the geometry and how Rhino works, and then try to use that Rhino, that geometry that you have done in Rhino, and use that in Grasshopper. So do, you don't start from the very beginning in Grasshopper. You are, you know, starting in Rhino a little bit. So I think it's going to be let's say it's going to be easier to manipulate the data later on in Grasshopper. It's a little bit of, of Rhino first. But I mean, that question I think is going to be much uh, better answered or replied in the, yeah, in the on Monday. Okay, so thank you very much. So I, so I guess for the for this question, uh, we will have to, well, we'll have to go through this session on Monday. A uh, question from Wilfred uh, Julio. Uh, would you say that digital fabrication has reached the level wherein the advantages, such as efficiency, data-driven design, uh, outweigh the cost and complexity? Are there applications of, its, uh, of it in less niche pavilion-type structures? So I guess the question is uh, the applications for more real-world, really usable by the public types of structures. Well, this is um, you know a very very interesting question. Yeah, uh, if I if I understand correctly, the the thing is suppose we we are in and the digital fabrication technologies, especially I want to talk a little bit uh, later on in uh, in the in the second part of the session today about digital fabrication dealing with robots, for example. I think uh, architecture is still. A a research process. I mean, they are trying, and, and Holcim, for example, is trying to apply all these solutions or these technologies in the affordable housing, let's say, uh, structures that, let's say, they are more standard ones. But it still is, uh, to be honest, it's a quite uh, research experimental process and therefore expensive <laughs> okay so you have to you know it's like research in medicine and so on at the first time you have to pay a lot of you have to put a lot of money on the table and a lot of technology so later on uh, in the future the um, the solutions could be cheaper and could be more affordable to and apply and uh, be applied into into let's say more a standard or affordable architecture all right, thank you, Architect Serio. So, so with that question, uh, it seems like the topic is moving a little bit towards the fabrication side of things. Uh, and I know that is the second part of today's seminar. So I think this might be a good time to uh, take that 10 minute break uh, for obviously for you to, uh, to get some water, get yourself ready for the next one and for our audience to uh, also understand, maybe to take a look at their notes uh, as they were watching the presentations. But before our break, uh, I'm looking at my second screen here and see that we have more than 200 registered participants uh, from more than 22 different schools and organizations, ACOM, Philippine Institute of Environmental Planning, City Planning and Development of Baguio, Met Architectural Design, Registered Brief Inc., Bulacan State University, De La Salle College of St. Benil, Cebu Institute of Technology and many more. So, you know what? It's amazing how uh, how far we're reaching right now. Uh, I'd, we'd like to thank our partners, uh, the UPCA, UPCA Alumni uh, Foundation, a uh, host in Philippines, for allowing us to uh, let Architect Sergio del Campo share his expertise with us. Right. So it is now 10:15. Uh, how about we take a 10-minute break for everyone? Uh, Architect Sergio can get ready for the second half uh, about digital fabrication. So we'll see everyone in 10 minutes at about 10.25. Thank you.
Concrete is the second most used material in the after water. With the world's population estimated to grow to 9 billion by 2050 and 2 billion more people expected to live in cities, 60% of the built environment is not yet built. This represents the equivalent of building New York City every single month. In a circular economy, nothing gets lost. Everything gets reused and recycled in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach. By giving a second life to construction and demolition waste, we can preserve Earth's precious resources. I see a great potential in this area when you consider that 1.6 billion people lack access to adequate housing in the world today. The NEST is the larger scale demonstrator to accelerate innovation and research in construction. Together with our 120 partners from academia, business and the public, explore the future of buildings. Concrete is a great material. It's very flexible, it's very performing. It's my belief there is no way without concrete for our future. As the world's global leader in building solutions, we are shaping the future of construction right here and right now. The future is green, the future is circular, the future is digital. Sustainability is a game changer for all of us. That's why I'm putting it at the heart of our strategy. And we are experimenting the next generation of circular products right here, with 50% recycled content inside. This is a cargo ship. And this represents what we are doing in sustainability in La Fache Sim, because it's a journey and as you can see, we are moving. But more than a journey, this one is removing 100 trucks of the road every single day. And this is exactly what we want to do. We want to build a world that works for the people and the planet. In La Fache Sim, we are firmly committed to be part of the solution to solve today's climate crisis. This is why we set the most ambitious 2030 target in our industry, validated by Science Based Target Initiative. Carbon neutral building is within our reach. You can see it happen all around us here. By pioneering new technologies from digitalization to 3D printing, we are shaping the next frontier of green building solutions. But we didn't just look at what's a long term goal, we look at what are we going to do tomorrow morning. So, no time to wait. We must start running right now. By using advanced computational design and engineering, we can model the structure of buildings so that material is only used where it's really needed. It's about optimizing material performance through structural geometry. In the HILO unit, we really want to show the future of construction in concrete. More specifically, we want to show a new way of building sustainably and following the principles of circular economy. I'm excited to work in concrete because you can shape concrete where it wants to be. We developed a concrete with 100% of the aggregates and 50% of the cement made from recycled construction demolition waste without compromise on performance. And concrete is a prime material to offer sustainability targets because it can be reused over and over and over again. What you see behind me right there. This is construction and demolition waste. This is basically an old building. We broke it down in those pieces. We're going to grind it, make it back into powder, straight back in our cement or in our concrete. This is how this year we recycled more than 48 million tons of waste, making us a leading waste treatment company. Our ambition is to reach 100 million tons of waste recycled by 2030. Sustainability is to do a better world for the planet, but also for the people. So let's talk about the people for a second. In Malawi, there is a shortage of 70,000 schools as of today. We are building our first school in 3D printing right there. This is how we can support livelihood with our products. The beauty of concrete is that it doesn't only bring high strength and durability to construction, it is also infinitely recyclable. That's why for me, 
It is the ideal material to build a net zero future. I'm a big believer in the circular economy. The future isn't written, it's built. IGP was initially recommended by my former thesis professor during my undergraduate degree and the reason why I chose IGP is because of the uniqueness and the flexibility of the program. I like the idea wherein your curriculum is based on your research program and the chance to collaborate with other disciplines. I chose to join the integrated graduate program because I thought it would be a good starting point to learn more about the field and also to expand our business. My background is interior design and I was practicing retail interior design for many years um, when I was working as an overflow policy in the Middle East. When I came home in 2019, that's when I thought of um, pursuing my long-delayed dream of having a master's degree. Um, I only thought of UP and I was so excited um, learning about IGP because by name itself, Integrated Graduate Program, the integration of various disciplines. And retail design is an integration of various disciplines as well. There's architecture, um, interior design, of course, marketing, and party sales and project management. And I wanted to know more about the space more about interior space, about architecture and urban setting and rural setting. And what I'm getting is when I started um, learning, taking the course is more than I was expecting. I was learning about place making, the thinking behind the structure, the concepts of urban planning and more. Its multidisciplinary approach make its really interesting and enriching in the studies on these fields. The IGP is strategically designed to help students from different disciplines fulfill the research potential. It is led and managed by world-class professors who are graduates of world-class universities in the Philippines and abroad. It is also enriched by the discussions from students from different disciplines that include architecture, engineering, social sciences, interior design, industrial design, and even law, where I come from. It was very exciting as an educator and a practicing interior designer to find out that there was a PhD in the IGP program in the College of Architecture. I chose this over other options because I felt that it was the most suitable for me where I could explore and learn more about how I can grow further as an interior designer looking beyond my profession. To start, I was able to recognize how I could connect any of the research themes to my discipline. I recall how I had questions regarding the suitability of some Western theories in our local context and felt that the IGP program was designed in such a way that would help me find these answers. 
Also, the program is designed, in my opinion, shorter and smarter than other programs. Every subject that you take is in connection to your proposed dissertation topic. So hopefully, by the time that you are finished taking all the required courses, you will have sufficient training and materials to pursue your dissertation. Welcome back, everyone. And we're about to start the second half of our uh, online seminar, Digital Fabrication Systems Linked with Parametric Design. Again, I would like to thank our uh, partners, uh, UP College of Architecture. And actually, I would like to mention the uh, Studio Laboratory, which I am part of uh, as part of UPCA, uh, UP Kaafi, OSIM Philippines, and everyone involved, and everyone here right now watching uh, online from wherever it is you are uh, in the world. Right. So during the first half, architect Sergio Del Campo walked us through parametric design or the opportunities presented by using different types of software to really expand our creativity. And now he's going to walk us through how to connect that and digitally fabricating things that may, at the beginning, uh, seem very difficult or nearly impossible to build in real life. So now I present to you Architect Sergio Del Campo for Digital Fabrication Systems linked with uh, Parametric Design. Some of them are, let's say, quite common nowadays, in especially, um, let's see if can, I'm trying to, maybe there is some delay in the, now it's working. Okay, there is some delay uh, in the in the cell phone micro. <laughs> so, let's start again. Thank you, thank you, Professor, for the introduction to this that I'm going to show some some uh, um, um, digital fabrication, like 3D printers, standard 3D printers. So, I mean, it's just a little bit about, about talking a, bit, a little bit about all these technologies. So let me share again the screen. Okay. Okay, I think we can find. So we are to the next talk about uh, different machines, the different uh, the typical machines that we can find in a digital fabrication laboratory and also in universities. At least in Spain, uh, most of universities they have a small fab lab. So the base is could be a 3D printer, uh, lace steel, the state of the art for this, uh, you know, for this digital fabrication part. But I, I'm gonna mention that because it's quite interesting to to see how the future, uh, the merging of architecture and robotics, could be uh, quite interesting for you know next years. Um, I mean, it's very first of all, it's very diffi difficult to let's say to class classify to you know arrange uh the multiple technology uh, you know these technologies are combined based on patents system based on different manufacturers so i mean you can find robots that they can make 3d prints another 3d printers that they combine laser technology with the 3d printers it's quite hard to you know identify and classify 
everything. So that's my, my you know, there were many ways to talk about uh, digital fabrication uh, part. So let's go for this, for the tools. This is a very, very simple way to, to you know, to divide the digital fabrication technologies. So, so some tools become uh, told that uh, these are additives, usually prototype that we can call it 3D print. The main advantage is they are user friendly and standard ones. On the other hand, they have some uh, the the piece of wood or stone or something, and they subtract. They they obtain the final shape just. Uh, detaching, you know, material. So usually, I'm, I'm I refer to milling machines, to laser machines, and so on. Yeah, yeah, these ones are more difficult to learn because they require some pre previous experience in the, you know, the management of, of, of the machine. Uh, uh, at least a broader. Of, of this is not a fabrication tool, but I, I, I want to mention it because this is uh, very connected, very linked to digital, you know, three scanners. And uh, it's the other way, it's reverse engineering. It's reverse engineering. I mean, they're trying to capture a real object to and, 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 and pass them into the world. So, applicate. That information, so and capture using clouds. Point clouds is a special type of geometry with thousands of points and x, y, and z coordinates. So, you know, at the end, you get uh, 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 a quite precise information from the real object, and then you bring that object into, you know, a three D where it's usually a special 3D scanner and management, and then, you know, 3D, you can use a milling machine or any other tool. Okay. I want to mention that picture, that's it. So you have to use or you use and so on to get 3D or 2D files, right, of, your, of what you're going to manufacture, to fabricate. Then you need a, a CAM software. Which is a you know parallel software that is computer uh, aided manufacturing. So at the end, what it's doing is getting that CAD information and convert it into generally a G code. It's quite popular, it's standard. And well, there are many softwares for that. Some of them they are coming with the machine, so you don't have to think a lot about that. But also you can install, you can get Alpha Cam. It's quite popular. Rhino Cam is a plugin for Cam in Rhino. And what is doing this Cam software is telling the machine, OK, do that. And how is connecting? Well, with the CNC machine, a computer numeral manufacturing. So this machine is ready to read that file, that Cam file, that G code. and obtain the instructions to start cutting, engraving, 3D printing, whatever. So there are many technology, CNC technology here. I mean, the most popular ones in, in what plasma but the most used in the digital fabrication and uh, reading architecture, I'm going to explain in this, in this uh, lecture machines and structures. Okay, these are the most big, and I have, uh, hopefully, universities that uh, you don't uh, if you want to make 3D doll. So, three printers. Of course, I, I know that you. Heard a lot about that. I remember ten years ago it was 
when you saw the 3D printer, it was innovations here. First of all, just to highlight uh, some pros, uh, of course, you can make very complex geometry easily. And this is important, interior hollow spaces. Before that, for 3D printers, the only way was getting you know, expensive molds and call a factory to try to you know, uh, obtain this piece with interior voids, interior hollow spaces there. Right? It was very difficult and expensive. Uh, most of them, they, they are uh, with, uh, they, they you can use in an in a office environment. And basically, you don't need a lot of experience to run a 3D printer, a standard one. Um, bad news, let's say, or, or things that they have some limitations, of course, the volume of the 3D printer, the larger volume you can 3D print, the more expensive or more sophisticated would be the, the 3D printer, some limitations in the materials, and still, it's say we can call it this is still high production cost. And let's say, although they call it rapid prototyping, let's say it's not still super fast. And yeah, you need something that they don't mention in the uh, news when you watch the TV and it's done with the 3D, 3D soft to design. Right? So, more different technologies. Um, this is a very, let's say, old video, but it's still quite useful because I'm talking here about powder 3D printers. So at the end, what, it, what it's doing, this is the CAM software that is reading the, the, your 3D uh, design and try to take that information into to the machine, right? So in this case, you have uh, Two deposits. In one, you put the powder, which is the most expensive thing in these kind of 3D printers, and it's taking a very thin, just 0 0.2 meters, 0 0.2 depends on the resolution you want to use. And uh, when you 3D print something, it's going to put a hardener substance. Sometimes some substance, or sometimes is is a uh, is a more chemical. Uh, stuff going on to get the solid piece of the 3D printer you want to, to obtain. And the process is always, this is important, the processes uh, of these 3D printers is always bottom to top. So you start 3D printing the bottom parts and going up to the top areas, okay? So that's the very, very simple technology or very simple 3D technology that also uh, quite popular in most of the 3D printers you may find in the, on the market, right? Um, just some examples. This is, was a C Corp uh, that um, was merged into 3D systems some years ago. So, you know, these companies, they usually, you know, uh, are absorbed by uh, another ones. But the idea here is that you can 3D print with color. And right now they are quite, uh, let's say, true colors, uh, very, very nice uh, fidelity of the colors. And, you know, as you can see, it's more for prototyping. They don't have a real, let's say, resistance of the material. Just to show the project could be an architectural model, could be a, you know, a mechanical part and so on. But just to show it, just to see the ergonomic, the ergonomics, just to see the the shape, the scale, and so on. There's nothing else here, okay? But of course, in this case, uh, this uh, machine uh, has only one deposit. So instead of have deposit A and deposit B, they have only just everything in one, but you see this complexity to, to obtain uh, with a different technology. And the good thing, the remaining powder, the powder that is not already hardened, it's, it, it's also it's a support for the multiple layers, for the higher layers. So it's, it's, it's nice to, to obtain complexity uh, using, and you don't have problems of support, the next layers and so on. Okay, something with another machines that you can face that. I'm oh, sorry. Skip that. There is another another one. This is really cool. Uh, SLA, sterilitography. I think it's correct. Uh, um, so in this using um, a light source, could be a laser operator to, to sinter a liquid resin, a liquid element, into a hardened plastic. OK, so it's giving you this kind of translucent pieces uh, using a liquid element. 
seconds. I'm going to, yeah. So this is a standard machine. It's not as expensive as you may all their technology. These 3D printers are usually quite expensive. Again, it really depends on the, the, the volume of printing and many other uh, parameters. But in this case, these are so, so nice also to get options here. I'm going to, you know, skip some parts in the video. So it's difficult to see. It's like, a, it reminds me to the Terminator movie, you know, that, uh, that is trying to 3 print here. There is an animation, how to, how it's, how it's working. The concept is very similar. It's layer by layer from bottom to the top. And this UV laser is trying to, you know, harden the, uh, the final shape. And in this case, it's an interior stir. So again, very hard to imagine that with a different technology approach. And in this case, you see where the, the final solution is, is then you see, it's merging from the, you know, from the water or well, this kind of liquid. And then you get this translucent part, right? Okay, another um, kind of 3D printers, SLS, Selective Laser Sintering. So it's combining the powder technology with a laser. So the, if you read that, the, the, the system is very similar to the powder. It's in a thin layer, and then it fuses the particles, the metal particles together to convert into a real solid. This is more, more to find because they are extremely expensive is more, more common to find in the active industry okay I, I heard some i read some articles that audi the car they have some some machines like that to produce a manufacture in the future some uh yeah some parts of the engines and so on because compared to the powder 3d printers these are metal so they have a, a structure Structural behavior and they can work as uh, mechanical uh, projects, right? So, so at the end, of course, the result you have to polish them the the, up, the pieces. But again, you can you can obtain these uh, consistent metal pieces using three D printing technology and for processes, for example, and so on. But the the way that it works is very very, very similar. So this is a small capture. Uh, the most popular ones, right? The FDM, Fused Deposition Modeling. So generally, uh, filament with a thermoplastic polymer going to, through a hidden nozzle and that on a build stage, kind of a bed, call it bed. And here you have, a, you know, there are many, many uh, three printers like this. BQ is, I bring that because it's a Spanish uh, brand, very popular there for cell phones, tablets, computers, and also three printers. And the Prusa, this is a, let's say, homemade, homemade uh, 3D printer. I had one in, in Spain, but it's very, uh, very, it's very hard, especially if you don't, you are, you are not a lot into electronics or mechanical engineering, it's very hard to repair and fix that. But the way, just in case that, I mean, I'm going fast because these are very, very um, can. At the end, it's like, you know, putting the, the very thin layer again, in this case of plastic. And the main problem of, especially of these homemade 3D printers is the, how to, how to fix that the first layer on the, depends on the 3D printer. Sometimes it's very hard to, to keep it there. Sometimes it's moving a little bit, so it takes uh, time to, to fix that, okay? But at the end, the result of the process is very similar to the other technology. The only thing here is that you don't have a powder. You don't have support. Of course, you can create with some CAM software. You can create special supports. But at the end, you have to think a little bit how to 3D print that because when you are losing the vertical direction, the Z direction, you know, you can make some failures on your, on your 3D printer model, right? So that's the only thing to consider with this uh, solution. And well, many materials, the most popular ones, plastic, ABS, or PLA. And sometimes they, they put down some wood or metal particles. It looks like wood, looks like metal, some pellets, some recycled materials. So there are many, many options there depending on the 
on the manufacturer. Um, other maybe not so common clay, ceramics, okay, you, you can also use uh, for very 3D printing processes, or glass. This is, of course, an experiment by MIT because glass, if I not run to, 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 to convert glass into a kind of liquid, uh, it requires like almost 1,600 degrees Celsius of temperatures. It's a lot, and it's very difficult to make it, but at least the uh, MIT uh, could could uh, um, work with that in uh, in one experiment with 3D printing using glass, okay. or maybe it is quite popular in the you know in medicine, biomaterials, uh, bioparticles, and other using artificial components, or also to display to show how is the you know your arteries going on and so on. They can 3D print and study much better you know, the, uh, the final solution, right? Or can more examples for medicine, for processes, quite for affordable processes, very, very useful, especially, you know, in countries, but that is more complicated to find or, um, or very expensive to find um, uh, good processes. Uh, they can, they, they're trying to, to work with 3D printers, food, uh, you see Barilla for pasta, chocolate, pizza. They're trying to, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, in future years to speed up the process and getting this solution. Already in fashion design, in shoes, uh, these Adidas shoes, I think they were released like uh, last year or something like that. So you can buy if they are on the market and the, the, uh, the soy is, is, is done with the printer. Nike is, is working also with these. Uh, uh, 3D printer technology and different different uh, uh, fashion designers that are using 3D printers for you know for multiple purposes here. Even automotive, you know, this uh, uh, car probably one of the first to to print to 3D print uh, um, the parts of the car uh, at least. The, you know, the surface or, uh, uh, shell of the car it would be possible to 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 go, and probably um, you're interested in large scale projects with 3D printers, right? So, well, some examples here: uh, the U.S. architects with plastics, I think 3D, right? But uh, similar to the let's say the standard ones. And concrete, well, we can call it cement because concrete is a more sophisticated material, but at least uh, in these this first attempts by Enrico Dini uh, using a printer 10 years ago, the D shape. Uh, I brought that because, I mean, maybe it's not the most beautiful bridge, but it's, uh, I mean, there is a kind of competition. To, to check who is the first to 3D print the first bridge, the first building, and so on and so on. But in this case, they say that the first 3D printed bridge in Spain by Iona and, and Iac, so, so they, they could use a, a concrete 3D printed to, to make that. Or, well, as you, I, I already watched uh, the, the video before that is for, uh, you know, La Forge Holes, and they're trying to the affordable construction processes. Uh, like this 3D print uh, school and trying to to use 3D printed processes to you know to 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 save the environment to to get more affordable houses and and use low carbon print and so on and wasp which is a wasp is a quite uh, popular 3D, uh, 3D printer brand. Um, they they run some experiments like these projects and guys in uh, uh, you know clay it's something the clay is something that you have on the side and take the earthen and try to put that in a 3D printer uh, and, and so it has a very good properties concerning environment concerning transportation of the material because it's already on the side and they were trying I mean you want to check that on walls uh, the walls with uh, rice that sometimes rice that is so popular food and the 
waste of the seed is uh, there is not a let's say a clear uh, solution what to do with that and they discovered that using the the rice uh, waste is it had really nice properties concerning uh, thermal isolation so they use that to put that in, in the walls and to gain a much better isolation and again you know it's my favorite uh research group uh the block research group in ath zurich and also with um, um with the collaboration of Halsim, they are trying to, and I, 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 I was, um, I was watching that is also in the video by, by Halsim that they're using, um, uh, trying to look for a lightweight solution, for the floor. So in this case, they're using 3D printing for the molds, and they just put it using that molds. Okay. So in this case, yeah, these high-low projects that uh, uh, it was already mentioned before. Uh, it's quite interesting the uh, you know the research they are doing in this in this solution lightweight solution again if you use the weight of the floor slabs you are you are, you are right and also with the dark curve solutions in the roof so yeah just go go to the Halsing website or or research group because they have plenty of information regarding these uh, solutions quite interesting solutions laser machine Okay, well, so we change. We come back again to talking a little bit about robots, but right now, let's go to to talk a little bit faster uh, the high precision uh, objects you can obtain from lasers machines. So at the end, it depends on the power you apply. You can high speed cut or just a nasher or engraving. So this is very popular in universities because the students it's very easy to manage that, and you can get very very fast cutting for your prototypings for your architectural models and so on. The only problem is the, is the limitation. Of course, if you have a very big machine, you can do whatever you want. But um, usually, uh, standard ones they are they have some limitation of the size of the panels, the thickness you can cut, and so on. So here you have a, a very short video using paper. OK, so I'm fast here. So you see the result is just cutting or, or engraving very a very thin layer of paper here, paper. And, and then you know the result is very difficult to obtain with another technology, right? One interesting is the curving technique. So it's detach some specific part of the of the MDF panel or any simple panel, and you you are able to to bend or to get curvature on, on the material. So the curving technique is probably one of the best laser uh, options for for trying to bend materials and so on. Just I just giving you some keywords. So if you are interested, just uh, write it. And then you can try to discover more things, of course, on the internet. I don't know what, how it call. This is a laser. It could be a 3D printer. I don't know. But this is solar sensor by Marcus Geiser. It's a very old project, but it's still worth to take a look to that. You know, not very comfortable to bring that in your office because you need well to 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 be on a desert, and. And connect that. You have a lens that it try to collect the sun rays, condense that into a certain point, and then what I what it's doing is, of course, there material. You have many materials because it's sun, right? When you put the sun over there, it's trying to merge the I think the quartz particle to get a solid piece coming from the sun, right? Here. OK, so a of precision on that, but just to show you a crazy, a crazy idea, right? Mini machines. So quite popular also in industry. Uh, and we have another machine there in control map. So the most important thing is to understand that it requires a base table, usually with a system to fix the panel, a backup system, and a bridge that uh, you can find there, the engine, and to place the milling tool 
uh, and work with different axes. And you have here many, depends on the milling tool you are using, you have many solutions, right? So, well, you can customize the milling machines. There are many sizes that you, for example, the ones you have on the left side, a huge, um, you know, milling machine, a more complicated axis could be from the sim could be two or three axes to five axes more used in the industry of uh, cars and so on and for example the one on the right is a quite standard milling machine that is very popular also in fab labs some examples just yes, with 2d cutting so we can obtain these uh, waffling systems that we already I already showed you in the first uh, presentation right uh, some more 2D cutting and going fast because I, I don't have a lot of time here and I want to explain you a little bit about robots. So in this case, we use these uh, cutting plywood boards to get this bench. So it's just planner, planner cutting, cutting. And piece by piece, of course, you need Rhino to identify all the pieces. Okay, and at the end, to get the final the final solution again it was a kind of experiment uh for a kind of sculpture project okay uh another sample in this case of 3d milling so try to you know um try to to obtain uh a milling surface a double curve surface using again grasshopper and again trying to obtain different approaches different designs different shapes okay so at the end the final result okay here you go okay and the last example sorry, the last example in this case we were following you know the isocurves of a surface given to the machine, so it could follow that path and get a more, let's say, yeah, rough surface solution, but it was something that the, cl the client wanted. And coming from, you know, timber beams, so it's a kind of discretization of the surface. Okay. So this is another way to, to deal with mini machines. So robots. And that's the most sophisticated part. OK. So you know, most of the machines they're using G-code, which is a very simple code. You know, it's, you know, put the G1 that is moving with a certain speed to that location, x, y, and z, and this layer height. It's something very easy to give to the machine. The robot, they are not so easy. You have a lot of data going on and depends on the robot structure, they have a different code. For example, this one is a rapid by ABB, but KUKA has a different coding, FANUC, they have a, a different coding. So it's very complicated. And especially when, I mean, we can define the robots like a programmable machines that carrying out, you know, work uh, reserved only for people and they have two main types, industrial and server, right? Just to define that some service um, uh, or for medical purposes, purposes, military robots, space robots, and so on. And the typical ones in industry for welding, painting, et cetera, right? So the most complicated thing is the axis. They have so many axes, especially when we go into these uh, six axis arm robots that they are very complicated to, you know, to deal with, okay? Mm -hmm because of the axis and the coding I was mentioned before. Uh, if you want to look at robots in architecture, <laughs> okay, you can find out. It's only for research. I mean, most of the robots, and here in Asia, you have many countries that they are state of the art in their robot technology, but they are reserved to electronics, automotive, metal industry. But architecture could be 0%, 0 0.1 percentage of, of the total robots in industry. So still, it's a, it's a research field in architecture. But I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Of course, depends on the what you put in the end effector. You can use the robot to 3D print. You can use, a, sorry, I just 
is that you can use the the robot to use as a milling machine, as a water jet machine, as a 3D printer, uh, metal welding. So many many options there in architecture. Some fast samples, very common one. These uh, um, guys from the ATH, uh, Gramsci and Color Architects. So they were placing based on the position of a slightly change of the angle of the brick, something maybe impossible in a standard construction, right? Or this one, trying to use drones to use these uh, kind of helicopters to place the, the, the pieces based on the data, the digital design data they, they have, right? Or this other one to generate complicated uh, joints and place the pieces, the, the timber pieces in, uh, let's say, a more sophisticated structure. OK, so that's experiment. It's Noeta, a very famous firm. So they're using also robots to, from the naval industry to generate this pavilion booth in the, the interior part, right? So, Probably, um, I think it's already stopped, but I think they're, they're going to manage that in South Korea. So it's a museum of robots uh, science. So robots are, you know, in charge of building the museum. So that's the concept, that's the idea. Or this experiment by, um, you know, uh, by uh, Mary Oxman from, U.S. So they, the the robots they can make itself the, the 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 filaments and and the structure, right? So it's a kind of warm, uh, you know, uh, approximation, right? Quite interesting. Um, light painting. Okay, this is not new. Light painting. It's in that Picasso or you with your camera uh, try to to play with. But with a robot, what's going on if you put a, a LED light into the tip, right, in the end effector? So with the camera, playing a little bit with the camera, you can, you know, the robot is moving, and then you can create these, you know, air shapes uh, uh, with different designs we carry out in the European universities some years ago. And also robots using 3D printing. Nagami Design in Spain, there are friends that they have uh, this wonderful robot. So they using plastic for 3D printing. And of course, you have the main advantage of the robots is that you have totally freedom of movement and you can 3D print in non-planner solutions, right? On this famous bridge, it's already, you know, try to robotic 3D printing or welding. I don't know, it's hard to identify. But in this case, they they were trying to, and there is a frame here, quite quite nice to to see that. So I have five minutes. I think um, I have time enough. You see here is like three D printing in the air, like a metal structure. Okay, so these were the first experiments to finally build. The, a bridge in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, that is already finished a couple of months ago. Okay, so these, you know, the robots are working with these experiments. And here you go, the, the, the final solution. Okay, that was, you know, a couple of months ago. So, more experiments with robots. In this case, what about in, uh, put some epoxy resin injection in sun? So it's very similar to the experiment of the solar center. So what they're doing, the sun is used as support. And then the resin epoxy is, is getting the solid structure on the, on the object, right? OK, this is Diego. <laughs> so he was in charge charge of the of that robot in the in the UK and some experiments I'm going fast with that because it's hard it's easy to understand sorry just playing with uh, a little bit of clothing or freaks here or just following the path of the G code so this you see these lines is the path that the robot is trying to 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 follow to give you the solution in this case with a ceramic component based. Okay, so it was trying to 
you know, to follow that that part. And because of gravity, at the end, you get some lower parts and it's getting you a nice texture here. Failures also can be uh, beautiful. As we decided it was collapsing this little shirt and we decided to, to to bake it in the kiln and so on. So, so it was a nice piece of art. And of course, if you want to more about it with Russ Hopper. There is a, a video that my my partner with Gianluca Pugliese that is uh, is in charge of WASP uh, in Madrid. So they they wrote uh, this this book that uh, is explaining how to reach these uh, structures using Grasshopper and getting from Grasshopper the G code and apply it into the three um, D uh, clay three D printer. Or a plastic field could be also, as you can see here. Okay, so it's it's really interesting to take a look to that. And finally, um, I'm using the last sample. I'm back again with the uh, with the beach. Uh, they finished this year with salt steam. Uh, so you see the process of fabrication at the end is just 3D printing. Uh, different parts of the um, of the bridge building uh, waffling technology. So as you can see here in some pictures, how the robot and is printing in no known planner. Uh, there are different layers of concrete to finish the different models, the different and again based on the shape, based on the on the form finding, they can finally. Uh, it's not necessary to go for. Uh, reinforcement of the concrete or uh, special fibers and so on. It's just working just by by uh, pure form, like the the old uh, masonry bridges. Okay, and you see the scaffolding. Probably is, I, I can see some brown areas. So maybe the 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 form works. These wood panels they were done with uh, using a laser cutting. Okay, so here is the you know, the final shape. And yeah, I think I'm on time. Sorry, I was very maybe too fast, but of course, if something is not clear or or, or I can try to solve, if you have any particular question, I, I will be very happy to to answer to that. So thanks, thanks for everything. Thank you, thank you, Architect Serio, for walking us through the different uh, opportunities for digital fabrication. Um, well, you, you did walk us through a, f uh, a few methods and then you ended up with uh, with using robots, which is a very exciting uh, uh, future for, for us, specifically here in the Philippines. Uh, but since we are not yet in the position to have the more advanced type of, uh, of fabrication techniques, as uh, you may have shown, uh, would you have any uh, idea or, uh, or or something you may want to share for us here that are more into the conventional type of construction and fabrication, how we can begin to move towards these new types of manufacturing and production systems. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, if you, because we, we already, we have helped some units in Spain that they were trying to start a fab lab. They had the, the, the same question, like you are saying that, okay, which, which machine I should buy or which, which is the starting point for going into this digital fabrication. So my, my suggestion is, is just run to, into a very basic 3D printing, just could be a FDM 3D printing, just with plastics and so on. So the students can learn very easy to manage that. And also a laser machine, because again, it's quite affordable. And also uh, they, they, you can cut a lot of pieces very, very fast. So these two systems, I think these are the best ones to start with. Later on, a milling machine is great. Yes, but a milling machine is more dangerous. <laughs> For special department in charge of the milling machine and so on, because the students cannot put their hands and it's quite dangerous. And also, uh, using milling tools requires a lot of experience because it's very easy to break the tool and so on. So, milling machines is the next step. And robots is the last one. The robots, 
I mean, right now we, are, we live in Instagram and Facebook, and you can see that uh, many people can find robots. And, and Well, first of all, very expensive, very extremely difficult to manage. I can manage a robot, to be honest, some experience in robotics. But still, and I don't going to, I'm not going to mention, but I'm sure that some universities, they have the robots for the Instagram pictures, but at the end, when you go to the university, the robot, it stopped because nobody can manage that. But maybe there was one guy in some years ago that was, he has this, or he or she has the skill to, to manage the robot. But later on, when this guy is gone, there is no, nobody can, can, can manage that because it's extremely difficult. So the robots, Right now, it's only for very, let's say, state. All right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Robots. Robots. We all want them. Uh, we all want to have access to them. But uh, if no one's there to operate it somehow or program it somehow, then it's, it's just there to look good. Yeah. Uh, but thank you very much for, for walking us through how to begin, because honestly, that's what we're trying to, uh, to grapple with. Uh, our students know of these things, uh, the existence of these things, uh, trying to integrate them into the college, into, into the curriculum. Uh, we would like a, a somewhat of a smoother transition going into that. All right, so now we have a question uh, from Eugene. Uh, do we need to learn Rhino first or Revit first? So I, I, I guess, again, how do we begin? in learning this and going into this realm. <laughs> uh, and you, you need to learn everything, <laughs> Revit and Rhino. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, of course, for this, if you, you are focused more in parametric design, digital fabrication, and so on, I think it's easier to learn Rhino and Grasshopper because Rhino is more user-friendly from AutoCAD or another typical CAD software. So you're going to be more comfortable using Rhino and Grasshopper. But of course, you need to, if you are working uh, in, let's say, a more standard construction, and then you want to manage data uh, according to construction phases, uh, budgets, uh, uh, drafting, and so on, Revit is a very, very powerful software. And as I told you before, there is a connection as you know, uh, uh, it it requires uh, uh, in right now nowadays to have some knowledge of, of a lot of software environment. That's the reason that the last version of Rhino they create this you know intermediate plugin at Revit. We can do very easily. You know, Revit way. This is possible something very quick in Rhino or in Revit. Yeah, so fact of the matter is there are many languages, there are many tools that you can use. Uh, and, and what's slowly happening now is they're all beginning to talk to each other so we can actually have one full, uh, uh, maybe just one language uh, in using the technology. Okay, now we have a question from Kirby. Uh, in your design experience, is parametric design more disaster res resilient? Which is very, very timely uh, and very significant here for us in the Philippines. Uh, Sergio, unfortunately, we, we at least I can't hear you uh, in your responses. Hello? There you go. Yeah, you're back. I, I think uh, I think the audio is back now. Just one second.
All right, we're just waiting for uh, some final adjustments here for the audio. Now it's... Yes, there you go, we can hear you. Now. Sorry, yeah, the cell phone just go crashed, but okay, okay, sorry, sorry about that. So um, uh, yeah, I was I was telling you that I, I'm not sure about the question if you mean with that with uh, earthquake or or uh, disasters like uh, uh, environmental disasters and so on. Does it right? Yes, it, 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 it seems like that is the direction of the question, especially here in the Philippines where we have we do have a lot of typhoons every year. Uh, earthquakes on occasion. You know, the direction that uh, Halsey is is taking that because uh, the the good thing is that three D printers, for example, is going to it is possible. I hope in the next years to uh, to to make very fast constructions. So in case that there is a disaster and uh, and affordable housing, the 3D printers can tr can try to, you know, using cement, using concrete, or also using clay. It's possible to to hopefully uh, in the future to to build in a way and case. So I, I'm I'm quite confident that that this technology can help to develop uh, a faster ways uh, for these situations. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Uh, the structures themselves to be built in the future using these uh, fabrication methods, they could be the ones that are resilient immediately. Right now, after a typhoon, when, when there are evacuees that need to be housed, maybe this could be the technology to, to actually uh, uh, keep them safe while they're rebuilding. Uh, right, we have a question from Ronald. Uh, given the choice between a laser cutting machine and an FDM, which is more useful in the university setting? <laughs> um, again, I think both technologies are quite good, depending on what you are looking for. If you are planning, probably if you are planning to to focus more the technology to get the fast architectural modeling, modeling or prototyping, uh, I think laser cutting it's, it's, it's extremely fast. And because you can cut uh, very cheap materials like MDF panels or plywood panels, uh, or many students that they need, you know, for the presentations and so on, they need a fast way to obtain uh, planar pieces so they can assemble later on very easily. It's still a quite fast technology. But also 3D printers, because at the end, if you want to produce something that is more complicated, more complex. FDM 3D printer could help a lot with that. The problem is, yes, it's still a slow process. I'm talking about, you know, standard 3D printers. So this is still a low process and it takes time to 3D print. Maybe, you know, a very small piece could be one hour or 30 minutes, depends on the you know resolution. But concerning many students going there trying to 3D print in something fast, still, it's a problem. So if you could take these two technologies, it's fine. If not, laser cutting, I think they are quite reliable also for for universities. Yeah, from what I'm from what I'm hearing, they both have their pros and cons. Obviously, time is one major thing. Uh, but in terms of the acad academic purposes of students, with maybe their studies uh, or, or uh, iterations. Uh, Either one would work, but you'd have to really change the parameters of what you're expecting to happen. Uh, all right, a question from Myri. Uh, for the two kinds of 3D printing, which is more accurate? Well, that, there are many kinds and combinations because as I mentioned, it really depends on the brand, depends on the patents they have. So, I mean, Accurate is a very difficult topic because it really depends on the machine itself and also the settings you put in the machine. So you can make a machine more or less accurate depends on the time. So imagine if I want to 3D print a small piece with a very high resolution, 
it takes me four hours. But again, if you don't have time and it's not very, very important to, you know, to the final uh, uh, to speed up the process. But if you mean with that to, to the technology, powder, the first uh, uh, 3D printers I, I show you, the powder one, they are very, very accurate. And you don't feel the, you know, the different uh, printing process. It's very difficult to recognize because they are working with uh, 0 0.01 millimeter resolution. It's almost nothing, right? But uh, yeah, if you go to the plastic 3D printers, the filament ones, uh, at the end, uh, depends on the accuracy, it's, a, it's a slightly uh, worse. But I mean, we're talking about fraction of millimeters. All right, so, so it seems like uh, if you want to the best one out of the box, uh, out of the printer, it might be the powder one. Uh, but of course, there's there's uh, issues of price that we're talking about and cost and all that, uh, and possibly probably uh, availability as well. Okay, we have time for one more question from Corazon Gonzalez. Uh, is there a specialized type of 3D printer for architecture forms? Uh, can you suggest affordable type of unit for school use for students? Right, that's always loaded when you put in affordable. That that's gonna be a <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, for architecture, for sure you need a large three uh, D printer, and that's not affordable. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's as I'm, uh, the pictures I was. If you if you think about that, they are more uh, research programs like. Like the one whole sim is is with the ETH of Zurich, and so on. Um, but in architecture, probably the if you are looking for you know uh, the budget that you have in mind, probably uh, I'm I'm talking about use the three D printers for uh, small architectural models, prototyping small pieces, and so on. So in this case, you can try the most affordable ones are them. Uh, 3D printers, like one with the filament, with a plastic technology or other type of technology. So there are many brands. One of them more reliable that, for example, the MakerBot is a, a quite uh, international brand, or the Prusa. The problem with the Prusa, if you are very, very, very good with uh, with uh, fixing troubles that you're getting, you can buy the pieces in China, for example, and they they give you the you know the, all the set of the pieces, and then you assemble that. But of course, you need experience in electronics and mechanical uh, stuff to try to assemble that. But my suggestion here is much better or more re reliable if you are dealing with the students that uh, you know there are many hands going on in the machine so it's better to try to to look for a good 3d printer and a reliable company brand and makerbot is a good one for example okay so makerbot is, is something uh, that we could look at yeah we're familiar with that brand um and from what i hear you can even 3d print the parts that you're that you know are gonna break. So you really, you're pretty much making your own 3D printer at some point. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Architect Del Campo. So that is all the questions at least we have time for right now. Uh, we will see you again on Monday. Uh, so um, let's see, let, let, me, let me be the one to close this up. All right, so as shown by the two, All right, that was that was me. Uh, so let me close this uh, this session up now. Uh, as shown by the two-part walkthrough given by architect uh, Sergio Del Campo, parametric design is generally a young system, still in the research and experimental experimentation stage of its life. Uh, which one? Which is one reason why it is a perfect method to integrate into our more traditional uh, architectural design processes right now. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to expand our creativity and take inspiration from nature or even abstract concepts. Uh, 
parametric design when coupled with digital fabrication or unconventional methods in our industry uh, can turn the wildest imaginations into something that people can use and appreciate. This gives the architecture profession in particular the chance to be a much bigger influence in changing the, the general appreciation of design and experience of the public. Uh, I'm Frederick Santos, part of the Architectural Communication Studio Laboratory, and on behalf of the UP College of Architecture, once again, would like to send our appreciation to the UP College of Architecture Alumni Foundation and Wholesome Philippines for making this opportunity available for all of us. To architect Sergio Del Campo for sharing his expertise and to each and everyone watching the online seminar for participating in this event today. Uh, today is part one of the series of learning events by the UP College of Architecture all part of the worldwide celebration of UN's habitat, uh, UN Habitat's Urban October for a better urban future. Please don't forget to fill out the feedback form with the link in the chat box. And there will also be an uploaded module about using Rhino for everyone to look over before we see each other again on Monday, October 18, for the module on Grasshopper for PBBF. I look forward to working with each and every one of you again as we continue this series on parametric design and digital fabrication. We'll see you all on Monday. Concrete is the second most used material in the world after water. With the world's population estimated to grow to 9 billion by 2050 and 2 billion more people expected to live in cities, 60% of the built environment is not yet built. This represents the equivalent of building New York City every single month. In a circular economy, nothing gets lost. Everything gets reused and recycled in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach. By giving a second life to construction and demolition waste, we can preserve Earth's precious resources. I see a great potential in this area when you consider that 1.6 billion people lack access to adequate housing in the world today. The NEST is the largest scale demonstrator to accelerate innovation and research in construction. Together with our 120 partners from academia, business and the public, explore the future of buildings. Concrete is a great material. It's very flexible, it's very performing. It's my belief there is no way without concrete for our future. As the world's global leader in building solutions, we are shaping the future of construction right here and right now. The future is green, the future is circular, the future is digital. Sustainability is a game changer for all of us. That's why I'm putting it at the heart of our strategy. And we are experimenting the next generation of circular products right here, with 50% recycled content inside. This is a cargo ship. And this represents what we are doing in sustainability in La Fache sur Sim, because it's a journey, and as you can see, we are moving. But more than a journey, this one is removing 100 trucks off the road every single day. 
And this is exactly what we want to do. We want to build a world that works for the people and the planet. In Lafarge Old Team, we are firmly committed to be part of the solution to solve today's climate crisis. This is why we set the most ambitious 2030 target in our industry, validated by Science Based Target Initiative. Carbon neutral building is within our reach. You can see it happen all around us here by pioneering new technologies from digitalization to 3D printing, we are shaping the next frontier of green building solutions. But we didn't just look at what's a long-term goal, we look at what are we going to do tomorrow morning? So, no time to wait. We must start running right now. By using advanced computational design and engineering, we can model the structure of buildings so that material is only used where it's really needed. It's about optimizing material performance through structural geometry. In the HILO unit, we really want to show the future of construction in concrete. More specifically, we want to show a new way of building sustainably and following the principles of circular economy. I'm excited to work in concrete because you can shape concrete where it wants to be. We developed a concrete with 100% of the aggregates and 50% of the cement made from recycled construction demolition waste without compromise on performance. And concrete is a prime material to offer sustainability targets because it can be reused over and over and over again. What you see behind me, right there, this is construction and demolition waste. This is basically an old building. We broke it down in those pieces. We're going to grind it, make it back into powder, straight back in our cement or in our concrete. This is how this year we recycled more than 48 million tons of waste, making us a leading waste treatment company. Our ambition is to reach 100 million tons of waste recycled by 2030. Sustainability is to do a better world for the planet, but also for the people. So let's talk about the people for a second. In Malawi, there is a shortage of 70,000 schools as of today. We are building our first school in 3D printing right there. This is how we can support livelihood with our products. The beauty of concrete is that it doesn't only bring high strength and durability to construction, it is also infinitely recyclable. That's why for me, it is the ideal material to build a net zero future. I'm a big believer in the circular economy. The future isn't written, it's built.